more of you than I remember. <laughs> I've seen you at other symposia or whatever, but I'm not very good at remembering faces, so uh, I'm glad to be here. And uh, so I'm doing something that might be a little different. I'm going to do spindle turning today, so I don't have a chuck and I don't have any scrapers. Um, and you know, I remember when I did a demo last year for the um, Upper Valley people. Peter James billed it as the other kind of woodchuck, which I thought was curious. You know, they don't want to have to worry about making two things that are exactly alike. And in spindle turning, that is so often where it's going. You know, you want to make four table legs that look alike. You want to make 20 balusters that look alike. So very often, in the realm of spindle turning, making a number of pieces that are exactly alike is pretty much where you have to go. That's not universally true, but so often in spindle turning. At any rate, I will touch a little bit on this question of duplication as we go along. But I'm going to focus today, well, my, my talk is spindle turning basics. Well, that means I'm going to try to start at the beginning. Some of you are beginners, some of you are advanced. I always try to hit on things that are interesting to everyone. But I will start at the beginning, and the, this talk is basically about basics. But what I'm going to try to focus on is what really is the difference between spindle turning and bowl turning in terms of which chisels you need, for example. If you already have all the chisels you need to make bowls and you want to get into spindle turning, what are the additional things you would have to buy? Okay, that would be one thing we'll talk about. Um, what about uh, the grain orientation, the way you uh, attack the wood, and the direction that you work. This is all very different in spindle turning than it is in bowl turning. And of course, work holding. We'll talk a little bit about <coughs> work holding. A lot of what I'm going to talk about relates to making furniture parts. Um, the work that I do is either furniture parts or architectural turns. You know, I mean, the most fun thing in the world is making porch posts. No, no, no. The most fun thing in the world is making pool cues. This has really become my passion lately. Um, but I don't get into that too much today, except that making a pool cue is more or less an extreme case of long and thin. Um, and I'm, I'm going to talk, you know, in order to do the demonstration of long and thin, I need to have two tool rest bases, and I don't have two. So I'm going to talk a little bit about it, but I can't actually demonstrate uh, how I use my steady rest. So that's what I'm going to do. Let me start right at the beginning. Uh, I don't want to talk too long before I start turning, but I'm going to start out quickly uh, saying, well, you know, if you, if you go out there and look at the chisels, there's an awful lot of chisels out there. And if you look in like a craft supplies or a Packard catalog, you'll see that each one of those catalogs has over 300 different chisels. If you actually count them, I have counted them. That's how I know. And you know, it's very hard for a beginner. So, oh, look, there's 300 chisels here. What, what chisel? Maybe I'll just buy this set. Well, you don't really want to buy that set because you don't want someone else to pick for you. You want to pick the chisels that you're going to use, that you're going to need for the kind of work that you do. But I'm going to start off by saying that there are five chisels that you must have to do spindle turning. And I already wrote this down. I got a little jump out of things. So these are, these are five chisels, and I'm going to show these to you, and I'm going to show you how that each one of these works. Um, so these are not the type of chisels you would use for bowl turning. In particular, you probably already know that to use a skin rough and gouge on a bowl is very dangerous. But why is it dangerous? Because it's just too big, and the width of the chip that it takes is just too wide. And the forces that are imparted when you go into, say, the end grain of a bowl is, is just too great for the chisel. A lot of accidents happen. A lot of people say, oh, it's a roughing gouge. You know, I'll rough out my bowl with that. No. You need to rough out your bowl with a, with a bowl gouge, which is essentially a much narrower thing. All right. On the subject of roughing gouge, uh, this is a roughing gouge, right? It looks like a half of a pipe, right? That's it. Not very complicated. A roughing gouge is made from a flat piece of steel that's then curled up into this shape. And that's what I've drawn here. Um, they come in different sizes. You know, in the old days, there were only two sizes. There was the three quarter and the one and a quarter. Of course, nowadays, there are some other sizes that you can get. But I would say that if you only have one rough and gouge, it should be the three quarter. You know, the larger ones are really only useful if you're 
if you're roughing out pine porch posts or something like that, you might want the bigger one. But if you're working in hardwood, you want the three-quarter inch size, not anything bigger. Especially if it's like figured hardwood, like figured maple or something like that. You definitely don't want anything bigger than a half an inch. You need to control the width of the chip. This is where most accidents happen and things go out of control and the, the, the amount of force that's imparted by the chisel is, is proportional to the width of the chip, much more so than the depth of the chip. A little more on that later. Okay, then spindle gouges usually come in four sizes. Um, the quarter, three-eighths, half, I guess there's a bigger size maybe, five-eighths, but the only two sizes that you need are the two middle sizes, which is the three-eighths, which looks like this. This car started out a little bit longer, <laughs> 40 years ago when I first got it. Um, and then the half inch size. And they're, they're actually identical, they're just, you know, the different sizes. I don't recommend the little tiny quarter inch ones, they're very flimsy. Um, and you really don't need anything much bigger than a half inch. The half inch spindle gouge is definitely the most useful, the most versatile of all the spindle turning chisels. If I was stuck on a desert island with only one chisel, it would be a half inch spindle gouge. I mean, can you rough out with, with the half inch with this? Well, it would take longer, but yes, of course you could. And, and you can do everything with that type of gouge except one thing, which is to make a sharp bottom B or a sharp inside corner. Because for that, you need number four, which is a skew chisel. Um, I don't like those really big skew chisels. I find that they're clumsy. They don't get into tight spaces. And they're really difficult to sharpen because there's an acre of area that you have to grind. When you're only using an eighth of an inch of a corner anyway, why do you want to sharpen all that huge amount of space? Um, Alan Lacer does amazingly delicate work with his gigantic skew. I don't know how he does it. Um, I like a skew that's about a half inch to three quarter inch wide. And that, uh, that, does, that does all I need. You know, I make turnings that are four feet in diameter. People say, John, you must have some really big chisels. And of course, it's really the other way around. Because when you're turning something that weighs 500 pounds and is four feet in diameter, you want a smaller chisel, not a bigger chisel. Well, why? It's because of what I just said. When you have something that big going around, believe me, there's some adrenaline involved with this. <laughs> and you want to be in control all the time. You don't want anything to go wrong. And that's why I go for a smaller chisel. A smaller chisel will take a narrower chip, impart less force, less chances of things going wrong. Maybe it takes a little longer to get there. That's OK. It's better than making a trip to the hospital. OK. Uh, there are many, I guess what I've drawn here are, are skew chisels. This is, these are cross sections of skew chisels, and I guess I'll say briefly a little bit about that. Um, a lot of, at least it used to be that the skew chisels that you buy were simply rectangular, and they had excruci excruciatingly sharp corners, so sharp that you might even cut your hand. Well, there, there's two things wrong with that. You cannot use a skew chisel like that, the way it comes out of the pack with the sharp corners. It's just not usable, and there's two reasons for that. One is that when you wrap your fingers around it, it slices your skin. But the, the real reason is that when you use a skew chisel, uh, when you use a skew chisel, you never use it lying flat like this or standing up like this. It's always at some angle, and so it's really the, the corner that's resting on the tool rest. Well, what's wrong with that? If it's sharp, two things go wrong. One is that you can't slide it along the tool rest, because that corner is like digging in, and the other is it's going to mutilate the surface of the tool rest because of its sharpness. So if you have a rectangular skew chisel, the first thing you've got to do is change it from this to this, which is simply a matter of rounding the corners. Um, and I used to do this with the chisel still in the handle, and then I realized it's so much easier to take it out of the handle. It's not a difficult thing. It makes the job so much easier of rounding the corners. Then you can put it on a belt machine and just roll it, and you get nice round corners. Beautiful. Okay. Uh, there's a kind of skew chisel that's called a rolled edge. So this is shaped like a racetrack. So it's got flat sides, but the ends are semicircular, and those are really good because that solves the problem. When the chisel's up on its end, it'll, it'll roll, and it will slide, and, and that's a really good. I don't see those that often, but um, in theory, I approve of that pretty much. And the kind of skew chisels I don't like are these, which are called oval skews. Um, 
because they're really very flimsy, especially in the small sizes. You know, they start with a rectangular one like that, and then they grind away so much <laughs> that it's hardly anything left of it. And especially in the happier size, they're just uh, very flimsy. So I, the other thing is that very often they have a sharp line at the bottom. For some reason, they round one end and the other end. So, so you really need to have, the skew chisel can't have any sharp corners in its profile because that will, again, inhibit the sliding of the chisel. Um, okay, so now we come to the last but not, uh, last but not least, the parting tool. Well, I always define, uh, describe a parting tool as a necessary evil. Well, what's evil about it? Well, the only thing that's evil about it is that it's so overused. You know, I, I see a lot of turners uh, who, you know, faced with a problem say, okay, I've got this. All right, here's a problem. I, I have to make this, this part here, and I have to do it exactly the same 10 times. So what I'll do is I'll take a parting tool and I'll go, cut, and I'll make, measure this one, and I'll measure this one, and I'll measure So every two inches I make a cut, and I measure it. Oh, that's good. Then I'll just connect the dots. But, you know, that's exactly the wrong way to go about this. And the reason for that is, once you've got those cuts in there, you're trying not to smooth that out. Every time your chisel gets one of those cuts, it like crashes down into that. And it's much harder to get the smooth line when you've got those interruptions in the line. Now, what you really want to do to make this line is to start here and as you get deeper, 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 you're continuously um, creating the shape until you get to the very last cut and all you're doing is smoothing it out. So, so I see a hardening tool often um, overused and used in the wrong way. Uh, a parting tool has some uses in uh, locating positions and duplication work, but it's not the kind of thing you'd want to use to mark out diameters repeatedly over a long curve. So these are the five chisels. And now we're going to use the five chisels and you'll see what they do. Um, you know, if you do bowl turning, and, and I'm sure that you have developed the skills of, of doing bowl turning through practice, but you really need to practice certain exercises. Um, I'm going I'm to back up a little bit here and, and, and talk about something very basic. So beginners, afterwards, so many people come up to me and say, you know, that was really an aha moment. And I'm going to show you something here that you may already know, but I want you to think very carefully about this. If you've used chisels at all in carving, or even mortising a hinge, or if you use handheld chisels, I'm sure that you know that, you know, there's a certain angle that the bevel is ground, and as I put this wood, this chisel against the wood, I'm going back and forth here, nothing's happening. Why? Because the part of the chisel that's hitting the wood is, is, is this, it's, it's not the edge. In order to get the edge to engage, I have to raise the handle slowly and all of a sudden something starts to happen because I've got the chisel at the right angle. So if I want to make like a scooping cut, then my hands go down like this and that makes a scooping cut. What does this mean? This means that the depth of the cut is controlled by the rubbing of the bevel. And I'm sure that you know this from your bowl turning. There's nothing different about this. Right? Now, you wouldn't want to carve wood by doing this, would you? Well, you know, actually, I am getting some, look, some wood came off there, didn't it? Well, there's a difference between this and this, isn't there? But that's not what's important, you know. It's not what you take off. It's what you leave behind that counts. So I'm going to unclamp this piece of wood from here so that you can see it better. And what you see is that the cuts that I made with the cutting tool are pretty smooth. The cuts I made this way, which is by a scraping process, is really a horrible finish. Now, why is that finish so horrible? Because I'm going across the grain. So I might have fooled you because this is a square piece of wood. But the grain of this piece of wood obviously goes this way. So when I attempt to scrape the wood across the grain, the result is always a terrible finish. Now, why is this important? Because in spindle turning, you're going across the grain 100% of the time. 
That's why scraping is a poor choice for spindle turning. I didn't bring any scrapers with me. I shouldn't say I never use scrapers. I think if you were making rosewood chess pieces or that sort of thing, you might use scrapers. But this explains why we don't use scrapers in spindle turn, right? We want, we want this and not this. But if, uh, many people think, oh, but wait a minute, I have this tool rest here, and when I put the tool on the tool rest, that changes everything, right? No. That doesn't change anything. You're still guiding the tool by its bevel. And if you got the handle up in the air and the chisel like this, then you're scraping. And you can do a lot of wood turning by scraping, and you get a lot of dust. Um, but you get a terrible finish. And what does it mean if you have a terrible finish? Well, that means you've got to sand it forever. You know, sanding is terrible. <laughs> sanding, sanding is boring. And sandpaper is expensive. And it usually leads to a poor end result, where the surface of the wood is lumpy, um, the sharpness, the crispness of the lines are gone. It looks like it was sanded on a machine with a flap sander or something. So the object, the, the chisel technique I'm going to show you today has one object, really, which is to get the best possible finish and the sharpest possible details right off of the chisel so that you don't need to sand much, if at all, because that always leads to a better conclusion. So the skills that I'm going to show you, they actually have five exercises. There's five chisels and there's five exercises. I live in a five world. So there's five exercises I'm going to show you that are things that you need to practice if you want to perfect your spindle turning skills. And the most important thing about practicing is, for God's sake, don't try to make anything. Just get a piece of wood that's free. Get a piece of wood in which you have nothing invested, and make all the mistakes that you can make. And this is how you will learn. If you're building up 100 pieces of wood that you've already spent 100 hours on this, and you put it on the lake, you're not really going to learn how to turn it, because you're so afraid to make a mistake. I've already put 100 hours into it. This is not hard. In New Hampshire, it shouldn't be that hard to find a piece of firewood. <laughs> and this is where you need to go first to practice these things, and I'm going to show you the five exercises now. And this was a tree growing in my backyard this morning, and now it's here for us. The best, the best wood is maple, uh, but you can really turn anything. I don't really like the um, oak, and, and, you know, it's kind of crumbly. You don't get the satisfaction of those long curly chips, but this is maple. I don't know how wet it is. Well, it, it, was, it was a living tree this morning, and now it's here for us. So let's see how this is going to go. And so a piece of wood like this that costs nothing, in which you have nothing invested, and this is what you want to practice on, because then you won't be afraid to make the mistake, mistakes, and you will be able to test the boundaries of what the different chisels will do. And that's how you learn what they will do and what they won't do. This is a spur center that has a spring in it. So if I want to stop it, I just back off the tailstock one revolution. The spring pushes the wood away from the spurs, and it's floating on there. And when I want to turn, I do that, and now it's good. So every piece of wood has to start out by being roughed out. So we have the, the spindle roughing gouge. And this works on wet wood, dry wood, round wood, square wood. This is a tool that's designed to remove the maximum amount of metal, uh, maximum amount of wood. I also turn metal, so I don't know, that's where my mind went. Remove the maximum amount of wood as quickly as possible. Another thing you may notice is that I use a lower RPM than most wood turners. Um, I don't really want things to happen faster. You know, I want to be in control. So, going back, you know, to this demonstration, 
It's the same thing I'm going to do here. Uh, as I bring the chisel up, the first part of the chisel that hits the wood is not the edge. The first part of the chisel that hits the wood is this part of the bell called the heel. And that's what's happening right here. The heel is hitting the wood. Uh, of course, it's not going to cut anything. <laughs> and from there, I gradually raise the handle until I see chips coming off the top. And that's exactly what I did here, right? I gradually raise the handle until it engaged. So the presence of a tool rest does not change these basic principles that I showed you there with the carbon chisel. So if you're up here like this, then you're scraping. So you need to start here and raise the handle. As soon as those chips start to happen, now you know you're at the right angle. And you just sort of lock in at that angle. Well, the angle will change as the diameter gets smaller, but I think for now, we're just locking in at that angle. I want to see if I'm through the bark. Yeah, you see the advantage of a spur center with a spring because you're not constantly turning the motor on and off. All right, this one more cut. I want to okay, so if, if you take um, take one of these chips and. Uh, if I got the light, okay, this isn't in your eyes, is it? If I got it rotated, okay, okay. If you look at the end of that chip, it has a certain cross section. I'm gonna go over here now. So the cross section of, if you look at the end of it here, pass it around. You know, you can learn a lot from chips. I mean, I did say that it's, it's not what you take off but what you leave behind that counts. Okay, still stand by that. But you can learn a lot from examining chips about the, cu the, the cutting mechanism, exactly what the chisel was doing. So that chip looks like this. Okay. That's what the chip looks like. It has a very horizontal orientation. Um, so you may ask, now I'm going to try to elaborate on, on what's important about this. Um, you may ask yourself, well, what's the most efficient way to rough out? Should I get the chisel in to a certain depth and then go across slowly? Or should I go into a very shallow depth and go across quickly? Which is, of course, what I did. And the answer is, the second way is much more efficient. Well, why? Well, remember that, that the grain of the wood right, is horizontal, like this, because right, we're going across. If, if you went into a, a, say, a half inch depth and tried to feed the tool across slowly, what you would have is a chip that looked like this. Right? And the grain is this way. Right? So both of these chips have approximately the same surface area. So you can say, well, what's the difference? Well, if this were plastic or metal, there would be no difference. But it's not, it's wood. And that grain direction is very important because in this case, you're cutting across all of that end grain. This chip is almost entirely end grain. And in this case, you're cutting across the grain. So as you probably know, it takes about one third as much force to cut across the grain as it does to cut through end grain. So it takes, this is three times as efficient as this, even though both of these chips have the same surface area. So a shallow cut that where you move the chisel across rapidly, if you look at the, the tool, you see that these cuts are, you know, three-eighths of an inch or a quarter. It could be as much as three-eighths of an inch wide. Um, this is the most efficient way to rough out. This distance here, this quarter inch, that's called the feed. Right? What is a feed? If you've ever done any metal turning, Jim, you know what feed is. So feed is how far the tool moves per revolution of the workpiece. It's really important in metal turning. But in wood turning too, you know, what, what I have here is a shallow depth and a rapid feed. And that's the most efficient way to rough it. Okay. 
Um, now, of course, once you've done that, if you, you know, in the process of roughing out, you might say, all right, well, that, that's good, but I want a smoother finish before I start doing other things. Well, of course, with the very same tool, you can get a much smoother finish simply by reducing the feed. All right, and now the feed is so small that you can't see the cuts anymore. And this is all true in bolt turning too, right? So that's, this is nothing new. Okay. Spindle roughing garage. Really important tool. I mean, if I were roughing out uh, furniture pieces like that, that's what I, what I rough out with. Um, maybe I should just say quickly about. Yeah, let's see how about this one. Here's a very typical uh, table leg. Well, this is the kind of table leg you, you use on a, a gate leg table or any table that has a bottom stretcher. Because right? you've got a square down here to attach the bottom stretcher, you got the square up here to attach the gate right? You know, this is this is what gets mortise. How many of you have done any furniture or are interested in doing furniture? Right, so you know. So this top square is where you put your mortise, and that's where the edge are down here. So why is this mortise in the center? Because this table had an H stretcher. Right? So one coming out here and then another one coming across. So what was I going to say about the, the, the roughing gouge? Okay. When you, when you sharp, a lot of people make a mistake when they sharpen a roughing gouge. And as they're rolling this around on their grinder, whether it's a belt or a wheel or whatever, they roll it too far and they end up with these corners getting rounded. That's a very no-no. Don't, you want these corners to be sharp right angles. And the reason for that is that when you're roughing out and you come up into this, you want to be able to get the chisel up on the side so that you can rough out right up to the shoulder. Now how we make these transition things, I'm going to get to that in just a little while. Um, you know, there are specific skills that you need to do furniture. Uh, like making these transition cuts from the square. And if you don't, or of course, if you're making Windsor chairs, you don't need to know that. Because in Windsor chairs, all the parts are turned all over, and there are no square parts. But most furniture does have square parts, because that's where the aprons and rails attach. Um, and so making that transition, I'm going to show you that in a while. All right, so. The five X, you know, the roughing out is not one of the five exercises. It's just the thing you got to do first before you get to anything serious. And now we're going to get serious. So the first exercise is called the ball. And the ball is just a big bead. All right, let me see if I got it. Good. Right here. Um, to make a ball, you know, we're going to start on the end. You know, I should say that in a lot of books, in a lot of books they say if you want to practice making beads, you take a pencil and go bung, 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 and then you make a bead and a bead and a bead and a bead. Now you've got five beads, throw that piece of wood away, you get another piece of wood. This is, this is a terrible way to practice. The way that you want to practice is by to say, well, here's a stroke that I'm trying to learn, right? I'm trying to learn how to go from the top in a kind of a spherical shape. Well, this is a quarter round, right? I'm just making a quarter round, starting from the top. And when you get to a, a depth that's approximately half of the depth that you started with, that's when you stop. You don't want to go deeper than that. So as a rule of thumb, very easy to remember that your small diameter should be about half of your big diameter. It's a good rule of thumb in, in all spindle turning design, although there are millions of exceptions. So in, in performing this, um, I don't want to make a bead. What I want to do is I want to keep practicing this, this one motion until I get it down. And I want to do it over and over again. Each time I'm taking off about a 32nd of an inch. And uh, See, now this proves that when you cut your maple trees in the middle of summer, they don't have a lot of water. This is very nice. Um, and I can practice, since I'm taking a 32nd of an inch each time, right, see that one a little scary. Of course, with wet wood, you do have this annoyance of the chips going out. Okay. Uh, since you're taking only a 32nd of an inch each time, 
You see that on this piece of wood, I could practice this maybe, you know, 300 times, right? So instead of five times. So I'm starting out with a chisel uh, angled about five degrees in the direction that I'm going to travel. You don't want the chisel straight out because otherwise you take out the material underneath it, it could plunge straight down. But just by turning the chisel just a few degrees, you eliminate that. And then I've got it angled just a little bit in the direction I'm going to travel. So here's my starting position. And what you're aiming for in the start is to get a very smooth transition from the horizontal line you know, to where the curve. So you don't have any sharp uh, transition as you start to go around. And then as you come around here, you know that this about halfway down, you need to raise the handle and swing to the right a little bit. This lays a little high for me. I'm getting short in my whole I don't know all these legs seem too high for me. Yeah, actually, I've lost an inch and a half. I'm scared. Um, and so, you see, I've already practiced this 10 times, and I've only, I've only consumed about a quarter of an inch of this material. This is how you want to practice, right? Because you can do the same thing over and over until you really feel that, and you just have it working just right every time, right? You don't, you don't practice until you get it right. You practice until you never get it wrong, and you develop confidence that way. Um, let's see, one more time. You know, on the last time you go slowly. Right now I want to practice the same thing on the left. Well, I have the spur center on the left. So, I might have, what I want to do is I don't want to go anywhere near the spur center. I want to create some space here so that I have room to work if I'm going to practice this left hand. So, So now, I've got some depth, and I have something I can work with here. Get a little closer. And doing the left hand, the left side, you know, you need to, every exercise needs to be practiced both right-handed and left-handed. However, if I feel like I can't do this left-handed, I can always cheat and do this. Just take it out, turn it around. <laughs> Right. And then I'm doing it right-handed. Well, so I've saved myself the difficulty of, of doing it left-handed if I feel that doing it left-handed is awkward. Um, but you really should practice everything, both right and left. And I, I want to say that, um, and by the way, you notice that when I take the work piece out and I put it back, it runs perfectly true. And it does that without fuss and without fail every time. And this is a really important thing that on your lathe, your, your centers need to be tuned so that that happens. If you're saying, well, I, I don't want to take it out because if I do, I'm going to put it back, it's going to be all wobbly. See, there's something wrong with your centers. You need to fix that. Because if you're operating without this ability, you're operating, operating at a great disadvantage. And we talk about duplication in a few minutes. I'll explain a little bit more about taking pieces out and putting them back and how important that is. So doing the left-hand side is harder because I'm moving the handle of the chisel toward my body. See, over here I'm moving it away. So I can either kind of move with it or I can just let my hand depart from my, from my chest and just be free. On this side I'm moving it toward my body so eventually it gets to a point where it's hitting me. And something has to happen. Well, either I can step back and pass it in front. I know some people even cut these handles off to facilitate that. Um, I don't like that exactly. Uh, the, the method that I, that I use is I, I start with my left foot. I know you can't see this. But I start with my left foot over here. So I'm, I'm starting out like this. And then as I get into this cut a little bit, I'm shifting my weight onto my left foot, and I'm able to get my body completely out of the way without falling over, because I've already got my, yes. John, I think for some of the beginners, it would be important to mention the importance of learning after dexterity. Well, I, that's a great point. And can a person learn after dexterity, or is it in their genes? I think some people are, some people can learn after dexterity, and some people like me can't. Or maybe I'm just lazy. <laughs> but, uh, I think, uh, I think it's a matter of discipline uh, and practice. 
Well, I did try it for a long time, and I gave up. <laughs> so I, I sort of learned how to do that. Um, you know, I mean, you know, like baseball players who bat two ways. It's a, uh, of course, I play pool, and I know that in pool, it's a great advantage to be able to shoot right and left-handed. Um, but I think some people's brains are wired to be able to do that, and others, I think it's very difficult. Uh, whether anyone can learn it, we can't debate that right here or now. <laughs> but uh, it's an interesting question. So I'd love to ask some brain science person. So what I've just shown you now is the ball shape. This is exercise number one. Now, and I've shown you how to do it right and left. Okay. Uh, and so far, I'm doing everything with just one chisel, maybe half inch spindle gouge. All right. Second exercise is called the bottle. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to continue on the same piece of wood here, um, just to save time. There you go. So this, this says I'm, I'm going about 1,200. Uh, which, again, I think that's slower than most people would do, but this is the speed that I like. Uh, one thing about turning a little bit slower is that your chisel stays sharp longer. Yeah, you know, there's... Anyway, that's right. All right. Here's something that's here's something that's counterintuitive, but nonetheless true. That it dulls a chisel quicker if you're taking a thin cut than if you're taking a heavy cut. That seems how could that be? But you probably notice this when you're getting to the very last stages of that bowl and you're trying to get a really good finish at the very end how quickly a chisel gets dull? Well, the reason is that when you're taking a heavy cut, um, the wood actually breaks out ahead of the edge, um, and the edge never actually touches the wood. But when you're taking a very thin cut, the chip that you're taking might be a thousandth of an inch, and because it's so flexible, it rubs against the edge, and that's what wears out the edge. Um, Turning a little slower and taking a slightly heavier chip that's still a control chip will actually go your chisel less. Okay. So the next, the next exercise is called a bottle. Well, the reason the bottle is number two is because you start the bottle shape exactly the same way you start the ball. That is, you're starting with the chisel from the top and trying to get a smooth transition. But with a bottle, I'm going to try to get this going a little bit. For the bottle, you're going to reverse the cut, convex to concave, when you get about halfway down. And again, um, your small diameter should be about half of your full diameter. Resist the temptation to go deeper each time. Because if you do that, eventually you're going to get so thin over here that you're going to start to experience workpiece vibration. And you have enough problems that you don't need to have that one additional problem. But notice how this starts out just like a ball. But then when you get about halfway down, you kind of reverse the process and it becomes a concave curve. Well, let's do it on this side. That's the bottom. Let's see why it's called a bottle. It's just like the neck of a bottle. Let's do this one again. Again, I'm doing all of these so far just with one chisel, the half-inch spindle gouge, the, the gouge that does more things than any other. All right. So now having done all that, so like maybe now I'm wondering, is this chisel really as sharp as it? I've done quite a bit of turning. I may want to sharpen this. So you probably know that I'm an advocate of belt sharpening. And uh, the reason is simply because with a belt machine, I can sharpen this chisel in seven seconds. And I never use hand hones because in a belt off system, there, are, there is no hand honing. Um, hand honing is inaccurate because it's done by hand. And it's also very slow because it's done by hand. And I also, believe in a single-tiered system as opposed to a two-tiered system. Now, what does that mean? In a two-tiered system, where 
say you're using a grinder. Well, you would grind the chisel, and then the next time you need to sharpen it, you wouldn't grind it. You would just hone it. And then the next time you would hone it. And the next time you would hone it. And after a certain number of honings, you'd go back to grinding. This is a two-tiered system. In a single-tiered system, you do exactly the same thing every time. And this is better for two reasons. One is that you don't have to decide which tier to go in on. And the other reason is that the edge that results is more consistent because you've done exactly the same thing to it each time. So how do you sharpen a chisel in seven seconds? And I should point out that the seven seconds includes the setting up of the machine. Right. So to start this, I'm going to unset up the machine. And I'm going to show you how we do this in seven seconds. Ready? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. You do exactly the same thing every time. There's none of this. <laughs> Recently, I was watching this movie of the Trojan War. And here's Achilles out there with all the little campfires and all the soldiers. And he's giving them the pep talk for the big battle. And what are the soldiers doing during this, getting ready for the big battle? They're rubbing stones on their swords. Oh my God, these people are still doing that 3,000 years later. <laughs> um, so now I didn't invent the belt buff system. Woodcraft Supply invented the belt buff system back in the 70s. They made the first commercial belt buff machine. Anybody remember that? He's nodding, I think maybe. Anybody remember that machine they made? Of course, they were $1,500, that was like $3,000 in today's money. So they didn't sell that many. Of course, the sorbet machine is also overpriced. But at any rate, um, what I did was, I, I changed the original machine. The original machine had a belt running over a contact wheel, so, but it was a big contact wheel. So the amount of hollowness was very small, but it was still hollow. Um, I, I really credit Woodcraft for discovering that belts are better than wheels. Uh, because you can change the belt in about 10 seconds, and therefore you can get the correct grit for the job that you're doing, rather than just trying to do everything on the same wheel. Um, and also understanding that going from belt to buff to wood is so efficient, it eliminates all that hand honing. Um, so needless to say, I don't, I don't think one should invest money in CBN wheels because again, you're, you're investing in a particular grit or two. For that amount of money, you could buy 10 belts of every grit and have a lifetime supply. And then when you needed a 60, you have 60. When you need 100, you have 100. When you need a 300, uh, 600, you have a 600. And it takes only, how long does it take to change your belt? It takes this long. Right? Take that one, put it on, boom. You can't do that with grinding. Um, and people say, well, John, you know, you're a professional wood turner, and that's why you're obsessed with the speed of sharpening. No, that's not why I'm obsessed. I admit that I'm obsessed with the speed of sharpening, but that's not why. Because I, like all of you, should be worried about sharpening procrastination. Everybody sort of nods when I say sharpening procrastination because everyone has experienced it. And no matter how many years you've been turning, like me, 55 years, sharpening procrastination is still that little bugaboo that sort of hangs over here. Oh, I know I should stop and sharpen this now. But I don't, but I don't really want to. So if you're having those thoughts that I know I should sharpen now, but for this or that reason, I don't want to stop, interrupt my work. This is why seven second sharpening is so important. Because it eliminates sharpening for It's also totally mindless, and you can't, you really can't do it wrong. And once you get this in the right slot, you can be looking the other way while you do it. Um, and you know, like you, I have a drawer full of, of uh, homes, uh, slip stones and homes in them. And I just don't open that drawer anymore. I really don't use any of the hand homes anymore. Um, 
What I have on here is 180 grit. Um, but anything between 120 and 320, you know, it kind of depends. But I think for delicate carving chisels, you know, you might want to use a 400 or a 600. But for wood turning, a little bit coarser belt, you know, a wood turning, especially if you're cutting through bark and whatever, uh, you know, you're delicate. The other question is about deburring. So I'm using a buffing wheel to deburr. And that, it really does the same thing as using a home to deburr, except it does it 50 times faster. Um, do you really need to deburr? Sometimes you don't. I mean, if, if you're turning a burrow and it's full of sand and you know, bark, and you know that that burr is going to be knocked off in about 10 seconds anyway, so no, maybe you don't need to deburr in every kind of situation. But if you're turning a very soft wood, a pine, or, uh, and, and, you, and you're really trying to get finishing cuts, uh, then I think deburring does produce an edge that's smoother and more consistent than allowing the burr to just break off on its own, which I think leaves an edge that's a little more ragged and not as consistent. Um, okay. Uh, next, next thing we want to do is, oh, the next thing we want to do, I could do this with a 3 8 gouge or half inch gouge. Well, maybe I'll do a little bit of both. So, up to now I was talking about um, when, you, when you bring the chisel up to the work, the first part of the chisel that touches the wood is not the edge, it's the heel. And then you raise the handle until the edge engages and then you know you're at the right angle. Okay, now forget that. Because now I'm going to show you a certain type of cut where it is the edge that engages first with the wood. So let's think about, you know, what, what makes, you know, you're all, if you've done spindle, even in bolt turning, of course, you have a situation we all call a catch. Well, a catch is what occurs whenever the sideways motion that's imparted to the chisel is a greater force than you can control with your hand, and then it just zip, and it, it goes into the wood. There are a lot of different kinds of catches and different situations that cause catches. And so it's a bugaboo in both bowl turning and spindle turning. But let's look at this situation um, with a gouge uh, going straight into a piece of wood. Um, if I'm standing back here, now I'm not imparting any sideways control on the chisel because I'm holding it back here. If I have the chisel straight up and I push it in, well, it is stable because it's cutting equally on both sides. If I tilt it to the right and push it in, it goes to the right. And if I tilt it to the left and go in, it goes to the left. So you may conclude from that that there really is only one stable position for the chisel, uh, and that would be straight up. But that's wrong. There's another stable position, and that would be turned right up at 90 degrees where the edge is tangent to the cutting circle. And what is a cutting circle? Well, when, whenever the chisel touches the wood like that, it makes a cutting circle. The cutting circle is the place where the action is happening. And it goes all the way around the wood. Now, a circle, as you may know, is a geometric object that lies in a plane. So a cutting circle is really defining a plane. And that plane is perpendicular to the axis of the workpiece. Right? So in order for the edge, to be tangent to the cutting circle, the part of the edge that touches the circle has to be exactly vertical. Now, with a very complex shape like this, which is curved this way and this way, getting that part of the edge to touch that circle exactly vertical can be tricky. You know, this is exactly the problem that you face when you're starting in at the rim of a bowl to go down and you begin, and you're trying to get that chisel to be stable as it first enters, and then zing! <laughs> but once you get in about an eighth of an inch, then you've got the bevel rubbing and everything's fine. Like, this is really the same thing. But first of all, let me get rid of this. So you see what, how much damage occurred there? <laughs> just from that. I'm just going to smooth that out so I have a, a smooth surface to work on here. So, you know, we need to do it this way and this way. But, so 
So exactly how far over you turn the chisel depends on what part of this edge is going to touch the work. And if I raise the handle more, then I'm just getting the nose, and that's a little bit better. And so I'm going to, you know what you want to do when you're making a code. Um, but, but then before I make an actual code, what I want to try to show you is what this is all about. So I get the edge to engage. It's just exactly the same thing you do, right, when you're starting the inside of a bowl. Okay? You get the edge to engage, and then, you know, I, you know this, this really is very analogous to doing the inside of a bowl. Right? I'm pulling the handle around. And this is, this is, you know, one half of a cove, isn't it? So, and then on this side, again, everything should be done both left and right, unless you're blessed with ambidextrity. Okay. You know, at, at this point, and of course, one thing I noticed about this lathe before I started is that right over here where the, where the thread ends is like a razor blade. Right there. So if I touch that to try to get the chips off of it, I'd be going to the hospital now. Naughty, naughty. Okay. It's funny how some engineers don't understand what is important. Um, back to this chart. I'm going to bring a couple of ideas together here. Um, my chisels are decidedly old school. Um, I'll show you a couple of funny things. I, I mean, I have a Scoochie guy up here and don't really use it that much, but if you look at my chisels there, some are new, some are old, some are 100 years old. Many of them are made from carbon tool steel. The same type of steel that was invented in Anatolia 3,000 years ago. And you say, well, you're a professional wood turner. Why are you using that crappy old steel? When you can sharpen in seven seconds, it doesn't matter. Right? So you have to sharpen a little more often. Big deal. Right? Okay. And another thing is that the claims that are made for this sophisticated steel are usually exaggerated. They say it lasts ten times longer or seven times longer. High-speed steel does not last five or seven times longer than carbon tool steel. It's maybe two times at the most. I think it's not even two times compared to, say, a Buck Brothers chisel that was made 120 years ago, oh, you know, like this. So before I talk about chisel steel, um, my chisels are decidedly old school. But another thing you may have noticed when I sharpen my dollars is that I do not use side grind. I don't use side grind on any of my chisels. Even my bowl gouges, and I don't make that many bowls, but um, Peter Block agrees with me. But side grinding makes wood turning harder, and it certainly makes sharpening harder, like 10 times harder. Um, so maybe I'm just lazy, and I don't want to side grind. But the reason that not side grinding is better is because I'm starting with the chisel like this, and once I get down, I want to rotate that chisel so it's more flat. And as I rotate the chisel, it does not change the direction that it's going, whereas a side ground chisel would. In other words, if you look at the chisel and the angle of it, as I rotate this, that angle never changes from here to here to here to here. And what that means is that when I'm in the cut, I can turn it any way I want to change the width of the cut or the shear angle and it doesn't alter the direction that the chisel's going. Whereas a side ground chisel, once you rotate it, it's going in a whole new direction. This makes wood turning harder because you're constantly compensating for that. All right. I'm not gonna say any more about it, but this is what I believe that I don't side grind any of my gouges. Um, let's talk a little bit about this. I mean, this is kind of an aside, but most people find this very interesting. The first high-speed steel chisel I ever bought was this Woodcraft Scutcher, maybe 40 years ago. 40 years ago, it was about an inch longer. Now, you might say, wait a minute, you're a professional turner. 
and you've been using this for 40 years and it's only an inch shorter? Well, yeah, that's right, I'll tell you why. Because when you have a good jig, you have, you're only taking off less than a thousandth of an inch each time you sharpen it. So I've sharpened this maybe 2,000 times, and it's only an inch shorter. Why? Because I have a good jig. What is a good jig? A good jig is a jig that will reproduce the angle automatically exactly the same without you having to fuss with it, without having to move it up and down and up and get it and tune it up. It's automatically the same because it's uh, incremental, like an anchor jig. I don't know why after all the decades that the Wolverine has been out there, why no one had the idea of making the Wolverine incremental until Peter James started doing it a few years ago on his belt machines. It was my idea, but anyway. Um, an incremental jig is a jig that snaps in particular positions so that you don't have to fuss with it tuning it in. See, this is where the old woodcraft, when I was using the old woodcraft machine, you know, 35 years ago, I realized it took longer to set up that, that bar than it took to actually grind. There's something wrong with this. Okay, so we solved that problem by making the jig incremental. But anyway, this was the first high speed steel chisel that I ever bought. And, uh, and I do love it. You know, so I grind my skew chisels a little differently from most people. First of all, the edge is not rounded. And secondly, it's a little bit more of an angle than most. See, because what I really like is for a skew chisel to have a very acute toe. So you have a heel and a toe that are very different and used for very different things. And when you round that, you're kind of eliminating that sharpness of that, that, that toe. And I'll show you this in a minute about how to use it. Can we get an exercise? Exercise four. Um, but then one day I was at a yard sale and I, and I found and I found this skew chisel. This is a Buck Brothers skew chisel. This has got to be 120 years old. I'm not sure if the handle is original. Certainly the ferrule is not original because it's copper pipe. But the handle might be original. Uh, so what's the difference between this chisel and this chisel? Well, the metallurgy is different. This is high speed steel. What is high speed steel? High speed steel is simply steel that has tungsten in it. About 15, 18 per, 18 percent is normal for high speed steel. When was high speed steel invented? It was invented in the 1920s and 30s, but it didn't really make inroads until World War II, when it started to be used in metal turning lathes and stuff like that. And at that time, high speed steel was only used in woodworking in the form of planer knives. But certainly, no handheld chisels were made from high speed steel until the 1980s when Sorby started making high-speed steel turning chisels. By that time, I already had 40 chisels, and they were all the old carbon tool steel. Uh, so for my whole career, I've used carbon tool steel and high-speed steel side by side. This is how I know that there isn't that much difference, really, in the edge hold and the building. But what I want to show you is not anything about metallurgy, because that's really not my field. But I want to show you that this chisel, a modern skew chisel, and by the way, this started out as a rectangular blade with really sharp corners, and I rounded the corners and made it usable. But you'll notice that it's the same thickness this way, the same thickness this way. Another thing you'll notice is that in order to make the tang go into the handle, they ground away more than half of it, so that the actual tang is only about a third of the cross-section of the original cross-section. Um, the, problem, the problem with this is that right here, where the chisel needs to be strongest, it's actually the weakest because they cut all the metal away. This is, this is the point at which all the flexing is going to occur, right there. And yet, they made it worse by grinding it that way. Here's a 120-year-old chisel made by Buck Brothers uh, in Massachusetts or Connecticut. I forget where they were. Well, one thing you'll notice is that it gets thicker as it goes up. Right? It's not the same thickness. Of course, this is made on a gigantic surface grinder. Right? <laughs> and so it has to be the same. This is how you mass produce stuff. It's all this is rolled out and then all the same thickness. And also, it gets thinner as it goes in here. And notice that to make the tang, they cut away almost nothing from the side so that the thickness of the metal here where it goes into the handle is substantial. This is the part of the chisel that needs to be the strongest, and they made it the strongest, the way it should be, the way it logically should be from an engineering point of view. So here we have what you might call inferior metallurgy, or certainly old-fashioned metallurgy, but it's a much better design tool than that. So why modern engineers 
have forgotten these simple things. Well, maybe they haven't forgotten. Maybe they, oh, it's just too expensive to make them like this. Forget it. Okay. That's my rank. But it's an interesting thing. Well, I guess there is a lesson to be learned here. Go to those yard sales in Nashville. You know, they have them in the fall and the spring. And, and you can buy these blades with no handles. They're like 10 bucks. And I think you can make a handle. You're a wood turner, right? Good spindle turning project. Um, and, you know, y you can live with this metallurgy if you have a seven second sharpening system. And you'll, you'll learn a lot. Okay, scooch is it. Um, oh, so the last thing, the last thing about the, 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 uh, the guy. So, you know, in, in real life, in real life, when, you, when you're making a code, you know, you're gonna make a code between two limits. And uh, I'm gonna use a smaller gouge here just to show you. You know, the first thing you gotta do is get some depth going. And what I've done there is I've used what's called sliding entry. When, you, when a gouge enters the wood, there's two different ways it can enter. It can be a piercing entry, which is where the edge actually pierces the wood like this, right? Or it can be a sliding entry where you just going in like that. Now a sliding entry only works up to an angle of about 45 degrees. And when it gets more steep than that, it's going to catch. Right? Well, maybe it's because that's the angle of the grind, 40 degrees. But I'm using the sliding entry to, to, to rough it out and get a certain amount of depth going. And once I have a certain amount of depth, then I'm going to change to the piercing entry method and work my way creeping up to the line and you know, rounding the bottom. So now I'm there, and now all I have to do is widen it a little bit until I come up to the pencil. Now you notice, this is the hard one for a right-handed because I gotta get myself way out of the way. Another thing is, I'm not holding the chisel like that because my thumb is inhibiting the angle. I gotta get my thumb on top so I can swing the chisel all the way over here. Right? And there we are, we're gonna go up to the line. And then over here, it's easier for a right-hander. And then after that, it's just a matter of getting the bottom. Now, if you, you know, you might need to be a certain depth here, and you check this with a caliper. So you kind of widen and deepen until the caliper fits in there, and that's, and that's how you do a code. But when you're practicing the code, you know, you're going to go in this way, and just repeatedly, oh, that's a heavy cut, and just repeatedly, you know, the, the wet wood is very forgiving. You see, I'm going almost an eighth of an inch. Um, you know, and then here. But I would say this, and you probably already know this, that when you're making that piercing entry and you got that edge, in it, if it's going to catch, you, you want to err on the safe side. You want it to, the chisel to be thrown to the left into the space. You don't want the chisel to be thrown to the right into the good wood that you need. So you, you, count, you, you err on the safe side, you overcompensate, and you roll the chisel over a little bit too much to the left, so when it enters, it, it, it might just jump to the left, but that's okay. Um, you just don't want it to go the other way into the wood that you need. But you see, by, by guiding it with a bevel, you can, you can clean up. Yeah. It makes a code very easy. All right. Um, I guess to save time, I'm just going to keep using the same piece of wood. Although I brought other pieces. I have how much left? 45. 45 left. Okay. So, I don't know. You want to stay all night? I'll stay all night. No, they're going to kick us out at nine, right? <laughs> Can we sleep here? No. No, they won't let us. So, the skew chisel. Many folks spend pages and pages explaining how to do this. How to plane cylindrical surfaces like this. And maybe you've tried this with, with some success or no success or whatever. Um, you don't have to learn how to do that. That's a perfectly useless skill. <laughs> because there's so much easier ways to do that. Um, for example, back, back to the half-inch spindle gouge. You, you'll notice if you look at the gouge that this part here between my fingers is actually pretty straight. That part of the, of the edge is pretty much a straight line. 
And so um, I can get the same kind of shearing cut like this. Now why is this easier? This is easier because this is what's called drag cutting. Drag cutting or pull cutting because the handle is ahead. So instead of trying to push the chisel in, right, I'm pulling the chisel. Pulling the chisel is always much more stable because of the vibrations or something goes wrong, it pushes the chisel away instead of causing it to go in. And you can do it left to right. So when you have little inconsistencies in the density of the wood, and it starts your chisel going like that, sometimes increasing the speed then will help to smooth that out. Just like if you have a tire that's out of balance, you go a little faster and it goes away, right? Okay, same. So, the, so for example, you know, on, on any kind of turning, you know, where you have these long uh, curves, or, or even, even a, a long taper like this one, right? So I think in most books they'd say, oh, use your skew chisel, you know, to make that long straight line. No, what a big waste of time trying to do that with a skew chisel. It's just very, very hard. So what is a skew chisel for? Well, I'll show you what a skew chisel is for. A skew chisel is indispensable. A skew chisel is for this. Right? And I'm working from the left and the right. And the left and the right. Because only a skew chisel will give you a sharp bottom of a V or any kind of sharp inside corner. And you can't, you see there's a little bit of fuzz right at the bottom. Sometimes you have to go in one more time just to clean that up. Um, you know, on the last cut, you go very slowly. I feel there's a little knot there. But if you go very slowly on the last cut, you can get an incredibly good finish. So let's watch this again. Well, before we do that, there, there, yeah, there is a little knot right there. There are three tricks to doing this. And I'm going to hold the chisel in here so you can see. The first trick is notice that the width of the V is slightly wider than the width of the, the angle, I would say the angle. The angle of the V is a little bit wider than the angle of the chisel. So this is, the, this is what I call wiggle room. You've got a little bit of room. And this is important because without that, you wouldn't make, be able to make headway. Now, every, every cut has to be a little deeper than the one before in order to make progress. If you ever chop down a tree with an ax, you know exactly what I'm doing here. Right? So it's really the same. Oh, does the camera show my thumbnail there? So I'm not showing anything right now, yeah. Oh, it's a little bit too overexposed. But as I, as I, I've gotten over there. As I rotate the chisel, I get to a place where the edge actually touches that kind of so, but not too much. And three, take the correct thickness of shaving. The idea of taking the correct thickness of shaving will be very important in the final exercise. Now that I've talked about it, I'm going to do it again. Now what, I, what I want. The, the surface upon which you initiate the cut has to run true. And one thing about turning logs is that as you turn into them, sometimes they deflect. Well, any wood can deflect as you turn into it. But the surface that you begin the cut on has to be running through. Otherwise, your chisel is going to be uh, bouncing as you start, and then that can cause a lot of problems, especially like with a ball. Right. First is, this is the only cut you make with the chisel literally straight up, is just punch. Especially in dry wood, you do not want to dwell on it, because um, there's nowhere for the chip to escape, and that's going to over, overheat the point of the tool if you uh, dwell in there. So it's just a punch, boom, in and out. And now, starting from the right, a 30 second over, I make that cut, the left, and the right, and the left. Now there's no law that says you can't make two cuts from the right, and then two cuts from the left, but you know, what, what happens usually is, you know, you, you're starting out with a, a pencil line, usually indicating a place where your V cut has to be. And, and by going alternately from the right and the left, you know, and hopefully taking about the same thickness of cut each time. When you get to the bottom, you're still going to be in line with where you want to be. This is a for aid in duplication. And I did want to save a few minutes to talk about duplication. 
But again, uh, when you get to the final cut, you go very slowly and you will get a really good finish you know, from the skew. So you see how, how I'm using the toe of the skew, which is very acute, because it penetrates very easily and it cuts very freely because you know, it's very narrow that way. Uh, so you might say, well, well, well what do you use the, uh, the heel for? Well, I'll just show you very quickly you know, what we use the heel for. Um, so I use a heel to come in here and meet this, you know, to make the inside corner like this. Do that, and then the heel will come in like that. So here, here I'm using this uh, method that I told you was useless, but um, it's I'm using it only, you know, for a very small detail. Okay. I want to get below that top. Okay, there's it. Oh, well, that's how you use the heel. The, the chisel that I use, I know I'm running out of time, so I'm just going to jump around. The chisel that I use most of the time for that is, this is a type of skew chisel. It's, um, it's made from round stock. I thought I invented this, and then one day they showed up in the Packard catalog. Um, the beauty of the round chisel, this, so this doesn't have an angle, although it could have an angle. Okay, so the, the round chisels could have an angle like this one, right? or it could be straight across like this one. Um, the, these go into very small spaces you know, where, where a larger skew chisel would go. And this is very good for you know, doing, doing inside corners and those kind of details in small spaces. So let's see. Well, I can't read. It. What is it? Twenty minutes. Thirty-five minutes. Okay, because okay, I got two more things. All right, there's two more things. Um, all right. So now, this. If you're interested in making furniture, then listen up. And like I said, you don't. If you're going to make Windsor chairs, you don't need. You don't need to learn this. You can just. Um, this one's already been centered, I'm not sure why. I'm going to take advantage of the time saving. And that is centered. Good. Um, what I'm going to show you now is how to make the transition cut from the square to the round. This is exercise number five. This is the, the most difficult of the basic exercises. And uh, again, a lot of people say, well, John, why are you calling that a basic exercise? Is it really hard? Um, because if you want to do furniture, you really have to master this. You really can't dodge it. You're going to have to practice it. Um, uh, I think I want to lower a little bit because it's a smaller diameter. Um, so, What's going to happen here? So this type of spur center has a guard, right? The spur center is underneath this. That guard is there um, to keep you from getting your sleeve or your hair or your jewelry tangled in that. Uh, I invented that. I have a patent on that. And Rikon makes those for me. And Woodcraft used to sell them. I don't know if they still do. But, so what happens here? See, the first part of this that touches the wood is the guard. And it acts like a synchronizer and gets the wood spinning at that speed. But it's, the spurs are not engaged yet. <laughs> it's just that that's a friction. And then the next now the spurs are engaged and I'm ready to turn. So that works very well. And you know, and the beauty of this is the ability to take it out and put it back and turn it end for end like I just did. Um, and every time you do that, it comes back to exact concentricity every time, without fuss and without fail. OK. So that's my live center making noise. So what I'm going to do here now, um, what I just did a minute ago, making the V cut, I'm going to do it exactly the same thing. 
except now I'm doing it into a square instead of in a round. So I'm initiating the cut in the square. And this is hard for one reason. And it's, remember the, the three tricks, the wiggle room, the tipping of the chisel, and the third thing was taking the correct thickness of shaving. And it's that third thing that's harder to do here because it's very hard to see where the chisel is actually starting to touch the wood. Um, one thing that helps and I forgot to bring with me is a, a piece of black paper. Um, if, if your tool rest base is not painted black, you should paint it black. Um, and you should have a, a black background behind the leg. Or I just have some black sandpaper usually that I put here and I stick a magnet on it and that <laughs> gives me a black background. Whenever you're doing intermittent work, which could be like this, or it could be um, like this, right? This is another kind of intermittent work. Having a black background really helps you see um, the ghost. You know, not the, the ghost of the world. Okay. So, otherwise, so the process is exactly the same. I'm just going to start over here just anyway. Okay. Going very gently at first. Now, if something's going to go wrong, it's going to go wrong right there. Because, you know, it's because it, you don't, you're not feeling very much resistance because uh, there's not very much wood pushing back on your chisel. And so there's a tendency to, like, push too hard in the beginning because you're not feeling anything. And then you're going too much and it's going to start to uh, make a chip. Okay. Um, so now I can actually start making a V and going from the right. I'm going to take a couple of cuts from the left. Cuts on the right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Another thing is that it's, um, it's harder to know when you're done. In other words, how do I know when I'm deep enough? Well, it's not easy to know. I mean, I, I can tell I'm not deep enough by the way it sounds and the way it feels, but it's a good thing to look. You see, I'm nowhere near deep enough. The way it sounds and the way it feels, right at the end of the cut, you should have a smooth sound, and then you know you're done. Ah, see that sounded different right at the end, and that means that I might have hit the solid. Yeah. Okay. Well, let me just take one more cut to get a nice smooth. So it's, you know, wood turning is like an auction. It's only the last cut that counts. <laughs> so um, the rest of it is just roughing out. But if I want to get a smooth finish here, I just do a very, very slow feed. I mentioned before, a very slow feed. Now, when you're, when you're making a transition cut, there's only one side that matters, and that's the side that's facing you know, the square. Now, people call this the pommel. Uh, I don't like to call it pommel, although that's the generally accepted term. Because if you look at pommel in the dictionary, it says a pommel is a knob. Um, you know, like a pommel on a horse saddle, right? Um, and there's nothing knob-like, I don't think of this. So I just call it the square part. Um, so if this is the top of the leg, and this is going to get roughed out, right, then it's only that face that matters, and this face doesn't matter. So let's look at that face, and what you'll notice, there's two things about this that's good. One is that there's no chipping of this surface anywhere. Of course, it would chip on the upside, right, there and there and there. There's no chipping of the surface. And that the finish that I've achieved there is really good and does not require sanding. And that's good because you can't sand it. You can't sand it. If you try to sand it, you're going to screw it up. It's got, you know, the crispness of this line is very important to the quality of the work. And if you try to sand that, you're going to lose the sharpness of that line. There's some wood turners, some of the English turners in the old book said, oh, I hand plane that after the turning. You really can't sand it or scrape it or plane it after the turning is done without damaging the turn. Believe me, I've tried it. It's almost impossible to work that surface with a plane without damaging the turn. Now, on, on some turnings, 
the depth of the transition cut goes below because the first feature is a B. This is very common, right? So you're actually going quite a bit below in order to the height of the B. But on some turnings, um, usually architectural work, well, starting on this one. So you'll see here where, where that flat is exactly or almost, it has to be a little smaller, but it's essentially the same diameter as a square. So in this kind of work, you have to stop exactly at that depth. And, and then you'll see it also here. And, that, and that's very common in architectural work. Um, uh, the other question, the other thing you'll notice is that on most furniture work, you know, the transition cut is at a, a certain angle, kind of a normal V angle, you know, of 30 degrees. Um, but in some cases like this, uh, the transition cut is square. And again, that, that's rarely used in furniture, but commonly used in architectural pieces. This is you know, a baluster for a stairway. Um, so you know, the, way, the way you make a square transition, um, which is harder, you, know, you, you kind of start out the same way. But then, at some point, you know, I'm going to lean over like this and try to make the V asymmetrical. square against that, it should be perfectly straight line and not bulge out or in. And the way you achieve that, um, the way you achieve that is you get this plane, this side of the chisel, you get that plane to fall exactly in that vertical plane, which, and then you get that. So that worked out pretty well. Um, this is the hardest of the exercises, but if you're going to make furniture, you have to do this. You have to work on this. And, and working, you can't practice this from a, a log from a firewood pile. You, know, you have to have some squares. They don't have to be perfectly milled on a planer. They could be just done on a table saw. They don't have to be super smooth. And this one just cut out on a table saw. As long as it's square, um, it's, it's perfectly good practice. You know, it looks like oak a little bit harder than this maple because oak's a little more splintery. Oh, but uh, can I bring any oak? I guess sometimes uh, people want oak balusters because they kind of look like chestnut. I don't know what it is. Um, but you know, given my choice in terms of um, architectural work, I would use maple if it's to be painted. I use soft maple um, or poplar. You know, here this is poplar. I'm going to show you a few things. Oh, no. 20 minutes, right? Or what? Yeah, 25. Oh, good. So this is a leg for a high boy. And it has a bottom stretcher, which is interesting. It's, you know, it's flat in this plane. So this is how that's done. Right. So that penetrates through that hole. And then there's that. Like, this goes up into the bottom of the frame. Um, I have in some symposiums I've done demonstrations of this. So this, this, you see, there's two center holes there, right? So this is um, multi-axis. So this is a re really functional, practical, you know, 300-year-old idea of using multi-axis um, to create this. What's called a pad foot, or a club foot, or a spoon foot, or Wallace Lane called it the Dutch foot. Here's a little bit different. One. Um, so. Now, on this leg, the transition is here. In other words, the off-center rotates around that point, whereas on most of these, the transition, the, the node, this is called, the, the node is right at the transition point. Okay, there's that. Um, 
You know, I brought some of this back to you a little bit. You know, this is, this is an example of kind of baluster that is extremely, look how thin this is, you know? It's only a half inch diameter, the smallest. You, you can't do this kind of stuff without a steady rest. And um, I couldn't do the steady rest demo for you today. Of course, I'm kind of running out of time. But um, I, I did that demo a few months ago at the, uh, in Canberra with that demo. But I'll, I'll do that again. Maybe the next symposium, I'll do the long, conquering the long and thin. You know, one of those. Um, and then I've also done some demonstrations regarding uh, taking pool cues, which is a kind of extreme case of long and thin. Uh, and that's really fun. Uh, all right, so the last thing I want to do is uh, I'm going to turn one more piece of wood. And I'm going to, it, you know, this is sort of a fun thing here. I'm just going to uh, put together a lot of the things that I was showing you before. Um, here, I don't really want to see that. Uh, let's just see what happens. Okay, uh, Blackboard. I'm just going to go to the Blackboard for one second, sorry. So I, I want to show you what I'm going to do before I actually do it. So you'll have an idea of where I'm going with this. Didn't use the Blackboard very much today. Um, so here's what I'm going to do now. I'm going to go uh, like that. Go right down. Because it really has its origin in the column bases that are a few thousand years old. And most classical turning design originates from those types of classical architecture forms. All right, so let me do that real quickly. And it puts a lot of these different skills together. And uh, I'll show you how I actually do it. And hopefully. You know, when you're centering a log, you know, you don't want to be too fussy because, uh, you know, it doesn't actually have a center. <laughs> you know, it's, in order for something to have a center, it has to be round or square. But uh, since it isn't round, it doesn't have a real center. What I'm just going to try to do is just lower a little bit to see. Okay. That's pretty good. And I'm running this in. Okay. I'm going to turn around and so I get a nice, uh, well embedded center of each. I don't know which one of these is Okay. This is good. All right. So, where do we start? Of course, we start with the roughing job. See how I'm using my hand like this? So I'm deflecting the chips away from my face. Um, you might do this in both ones too. I mean, I could just let the chips fly and it's kind of like more exciting, but in reality, you don't want that stuff going in your face. You really can get a damn good finish just from a rough and down. Get it sharp and uh, reduce the heat. So, let's see where we're Trying to lay it out, you know. I'm just pulling it out there. I guess we'll just go big like this. It'll take less time. Okay. 
<laughs> All right, first thing, the first thing to do is um, make some room here. And um, if I could get over, I'm sorry, I keep setting up and then I have to go back over. Um, Right here. Oh, excellent. Oh, it's broke. It's broken. It's broken. Oh, it fell. Yeah. All right. So, so what? I, so here, here's this. Here's where I'm starting from, right? From this. And when I when I rough out, I want to get below that line. So I'm kind of roughing out like this. Okay. So that I'm below, I'm below this line. Right. So that's uh, that's called the make room. Just making room to uh, continue. So let me do that on each one of these places. Here. Sliding entry, trying to get some depth, and trying to keep things symmetrical. So the lowest point is halfway between the pencil lines. Exercise number one. Here we are doing it. And I'm leaving the pencil lines there for now because they're helping me. They're helping me achieve symmetry that I need, the spacing. Of course, it's all very inaccurate because it was all done by eye anyway. But I'll leave the pencil lines until the end because it'll help me get the spacing correct. You see how I just pull that over? That's really kind of theoretically wrong, but you know, it gets it done. Same depth, so well, they should be kind of. And uh, so you know, I'm working from the top down. In other words, I want to get I want to get the tops done and before I start to go to the smaller diameter details. And I guess it's time to get rid of the pencil lines. And now I'm just going to make these a little bit narrower. Nice slide. Here. i got to fix this. Okay. And I'm making these a little bit narrower. things, but we're doing it fast. Um, all right, as I go down, let's, so the next detail that has to be dealt with are the, um, the little shoulders. And to do the inside corner, I'm using this chisel, uh, which, oh, you can do this with an ordinary speed chisel as long as it's, you know, a small one. Um, and I'm going to pick up the cut, 
like that. And you know, you have to make that cut down before you make the cut over. And I try to meet that. Good, okay, here. Try to pick that up. And then, and then, oops, there's a little, there. That looks all right. Okay, good enough. Here. All right, and so skew chisel, inside corners, sharp V's. That's the chisel for that. But you don't need to use a ski chisel for cleaning. Uh, right now we've got to fix up the bottoms of those coves. I think I'm going to use a 3 8 uh, spindle gouge. I can find the shirt. This is an interesting thing. Here's a 100 year old 3 8 spindle gouge. And here's a sorbet. I mean, they're this exactly the same. The business end is exactly the same. The edge is exactly the same. But this is such a different, this is forged. You know, this is milled out of round stock. See, what's good about this is that it gets thicker as it goes up, so it has strength in the middle. Of course, this achieves strength in the middle because the flute doesn't go all the way up. Um, anyway, that's good. Perfect. So here we do the piercing entry. And we try to get the shoulders to all be about the same width. If, in terms of them all being the same depth, um, you would use a caliper to check that. I'm not going to be that fussy. I, I forgot to bring a caliper. Uh, uh, I guess I don't need it. I forgot to bring it. I can see that that's a little higher than that. Okay, you'll have to excuse these little errors. But it's the process we're trying to get going. Good. So you notice when you, in doing the, the coves, how I, I always work down toward the, in spindle turning, you always go from the larger diameter to the smaller diameter. Of course, I should have said this two, two hours ago. Um, you know, like if, if you were sharpening a pencil you, with a pocket knife, you wouldn't go this way, would you? You'd have to go that way. Because you're always going down to the smaller diameter. And it's the same thing in spindle the larger diameter for the small. So when you get to the bottom of the cove, you don't continue on up the other side. That would be disastrous because you'd be going up grain. So you work right down to the bottom and then you stop and then you pick it up from the other side. Because you always work to the smaller diameter from the top. You always work from the top down. All right, we're getting there. I can see how these are all uneven and not symmetrical, but that's okay. We will live with that. Yeah. Alright, so this one will be deeper, so what? We don't have a caliper, so we don't care. Thank you, everybody.